Good morning, everybody uh, here joining us in Australia and good evening to the numerous US guests who are joining us for this Wednesday Geoscience Australia public seminar. Uh, my name is David Hudson. I'm from the Satellite Land Imaging Collection branch here at Geoscience Australia uh, and I'll be chairing the seminar today. Uh, first, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continued connection to land, waters, skies and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Today we'll be hearing from Dr Medhavi Thankapan. Medhavi will be presenting on Satellite Symphony in Space. Medhavi has worked in the Earth observation field for over 35 years with postgraduate uh, qualifications in science and in management, with his experience focusing on calibration, validation, quality assurance in the Earth observation domain, and applications covering both optical and radar types of data. Medhavi represents Geoscience Australia at the International Committee on Earth Observing Satellites, or SEALS, uh, and is a member of the Working Group on Calibration and Validation. He's also on the Editorial Advisory Board of numerous remote sensing journal publications, and at his role in Geoscience Australia, he's the Director of Data Processing Quality and Integrity. If you could please join me in making welcome Dr. Medhavi Thankapan to the podium. Thanks, Dave, for that kind introduction. And good morning and welcome everybody, um, both here in the Ragged Theatre today, and also a number of you are joining us online. And I know a lot of our collaborators from the US are also online, so uh, welcome, guys. Um, so today's talk is about data quality in Earth observation and why we care about it. I'll also use this opportunity to highlight our recently published collaborative work on a scientific concept for harmonizing data from several Earth observing systems to achieve consistent data quality. So, so just to give you a flavor of the outline of the talk, um, I'll start off with some high level context of the, for this talk, then look at some EO data quality issues and why they're important in terms of uh, harmonization of data sets and the role of calibration um, that calibration plays in, in harmonizing data sets. I'll talk about the uh, cross calibration concept I mentioned and I'll give you a couple of examples of the value of using harmonized Earth observation data uh, and realizing the full potential of the data sets that we have access to. And finally, finish with a summary of the take home messages. So, um, what I'd like to show you is, and it's common knowledge that the volumes of Earth observation data that we have access to are growing phenomenally. And they're being generated continuously by a multitude of several uh, satellites currently in orbit. And you'll see from the graphic here that the orange bars in the graphic represent commercial satellite launches. And the blue bars are the government launches. And you can see the, um, the tremendous increase, especially in the last 10 years, of commercial satellite launches compared to the government launches. Now, what's, what's significant about that? Most of the commercial systems tend to be smaller satellites with size, power, and uh, volume constraints. And that's mainly to keep the budget. So they might not have the full capability of say some of the bigger systems, the, uh, the bigger satellites that would carry equipment to do self-calibration while in orbit. And we'll talk about that uh, through the rest of this presentation. So while there are huge amounts of data that are available globally, the full potential for the information and insights from these data streams has not been realized fully. And data quality has to play a huge role in that because if you, if you have variable quality across systems, you cannot bring them together to use them. 
The map in the middle shows you uh, the number of satellites, Earth observation satellites, not, not all satellites, Earth observation satellites that have been launched by the different countries. And if you can read the number in the middle for Australia, it's just one at the moment. Uh, actually, it's two uh, from, from uh, just two weeks ago, so that's not caught up with the, with the table there. Um, that's, and that means that we're heavily reliant on our international collaborators for our Earth observation data sets. So a recent report uh, from the World Economic Forum and Deloitte shows the value creation potential of Earth observation data. And what you see in this chart, the blue bars represent the current value of Earth observation data that's in the year 2023. And the green bars represent the projected value of Earth observation data uh, in the year 2030. So this is the potential uh, for growth in value from the Earth observation data sets. And what is interesting to note is for our region, the Asia Pacific, the projected growth is to the tune of $315 billion. So that's huge. So if you compare that with say Europe, that's three times the projected value for Europe. So there's a huge potential for use and application of Earth observation data that's available to create value, to create economic value. And recently there's been a lot of talk and dis discussion about trust in data more generally, more broadly. But that's true in the case of Earth, in, in the case of Earth observation data as well. So trust, quality, consistency, they've all been recurrent themes uh, as recent reports would suggest. Now I'll give you some examples of some of the reports that have come out recently. But trust and quality in data have also been identified as key underpinnings for a thriving Earth observation industry sector. So here's another report from April 2024 uh, from the Australian Centre for Space Governance that highlights the importance of trust and the associated risks and opportunities for us here in Australia. I probably labour the point here, but recent reports on the risks to EO data supply also highlight the quality of data and the calibration and validation as important elements to mitigate that risk. So uh, we've got plenty of these reports talking about trust, quality and confidence in the, in the data sets. So why does quality in Earth observation data get so much attention? Let's begin by looking at some of the quality issues in Earth observation and how we might be able to overcome those issues. So we can expect some differences in Earth observation data quality because those differences stem from the design of sensors and their imaging characteristics and approaches used for calibrating them and monitoring their performance over time. So if you can, if you can think of maybe uh, two camera brands from different manufacturers taking similar pictures or same pictures, you can expect to see some differences because of the way they've built their sensors and, the, and their uh, characteristics. So similar kind of idea, but also remembering that once satellites are launched in space, they uh, undergo this, the harsh space environment and uh, sensors are likely to degrade. So there's, a, there's an important need for the sensor quality to be monitored over time so that you get consistent data quality throughout the life of the mission. So that's, that's something to remember. So what I want to show you here is typical data quality issues that we face in uh, Earth observation. So what you see here, or what you're going to see here, is a plot of data collected over the same paddock over a 12-month period, so that the paddock is, uh, is marked in the, in the white dotted uh, rectangle there. And the data comes from three different satellites, Landsat, PlanetScope, and Sentinel. They're similar kind of sensors. And what you're going to see here is a measure called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which, is, which shows the density of vegetation in that paddock over the 12-month period recorded by three satellites. And you'll see uh, what you'd expect to see ideally would be that these three profiles match because they are over the same paddock, they're measuring the same vegetation over the 12 month period, um, but you can see that they are pretty different. Um, so they're very noisy and very different because they're not calibrated. So this is a typical issue that we face in Earth observation data sets. The variable quality means you cannot bring them together to get better insights and um, and we talk a lot about 
AI and ML. So they're not going to fix the, the quality issue themselves because the inherent data quality, if it's poor, you're going to get poor results from AI and ML. So it's, it's the same, it's a garbage in, garbage out principle. So we need to have high quality data that's consistent if we aim to use uh, data sets from different sources in the same application. So this is where cross calibration comes in and uh, it's, it's an approach that enables us to bring the consistency among the data sets. So let's look at what's involved and some of the benefits of cross calibration. So here you see, um, well, the satellite cross calibration, let's start off with the benefits. It helps us identify the sensor issues, issues in the sensor because you, you, you have confidence when you're calibrating them against, calibrating the sensor against a known standard. So that's the basic principle on which cross calibration is based. You need to be able to trace it back to a known standard and therefore you would have confidence if you're doing the calibration about the performance of the, center, the sensor over time. It also increases the individual um, confidence in the individual calibration of satellites and monitoring sensor performance over time. More importantly, the consistency and quality of data that comes from those satellites over the mission life is, is what is enabled by cross calibration. And when you have global data sets that are global products that are being put together with data sets from different sources because no single satellite covers the entire globe at one time and you need to use different data sets. A fundamental prerequisite for that is to have cross calibration done to those data sets before you bring the uh, data together. Now, some systems like Landsats, for example, and I'll show you why uh, later on, they do carry onboard uh, calibration equipment which means they are able to monitor their own performance over time and make sure that the data that's produced by those satellites are well calibrated. Now, why don't all these satellites carry self-calibration equipment? That, that might be a question. And the reason for that is every gram of mass that goes on a satellite means you're going to have to have extra um, thrust to put that into orbit. So it's an expensive affair going into space. So uh, it also increases the complexity uh, and therefore not all systems carry uh, onboard calibration equipment. And what is sacrificed most often is the self-calibration equipment in place of having pre-launch calibration in the laboratory to characterize the sensor and then relying on post-launch calibration using ground-based assets once the satellite's up in orbit. And we look at some of those approaches um, shortly. So, um, so what I wanted to show in this graphic here is the kind of differences you would expect to see in the calibration uncertainty between Landsat satellites, because it's a well-characterized system over a number of years, compared to several other commercial systems. So the, the colored bars represent the, the commercial systems and the, I think I should use the cursor here, so you see the little gray boxes that sit, sit very close to the the zero line, that's Landsat, the uncertainty of Landsat, which is around 3% when you look at the numbers compared to over 5% for several other commercial systems. So that's the kind of indicative differences you see in calibration between Landsats and the other systems. So, and for that reason, Landsat is called the gold standard. So why is it, um, so, so several other reasons why um, uh, Landsat is considered the gold standard. And what I've shown in this, in this graphic is a study that had looked at Landsats 1 to 8, so over a 45 year period, uh, looking at the same sites in the Sonoran Desert, looking at invariant sites as a calibration uh, source. And what you can see in this graphic is after calibration of all the sensors that are listed on the side here from the, um, from the Landsat series of satellites, the differences in calibration are on the order of 3% or less. Without the calibration, it's a whopping 15%. So this also highlights the need for getting your calibration done even for the same family or similar family of sensors, not just 
different satellites with the same family of sensors, you need to have calibration to, to, uh, to get your uh, data working properly, uh, as in you know, integrating together. So we'll talk about pseudo-invariant sites. So these are sites that are used as calibration targets because they don't vary over time and they can be used as stable means of uh, comparing measurements on the ground with the satellite networks. So um, this is just a quick primer, if you like, uh, to tell you how cross-calibration is done. So the key, key to cross-calibration, as I mentioned before, is to have a known standard as reference to provide the traceability. And often the reference is, a, is an international systems of, a system of units reference, so SI traceable reference, you, you use that uh, term in EO. Um, and such a standard could be a stable natural target on Earth, like the PICS targets I mentioned in the previous slide. It could also be things in space, like the moon. So the moon has got a stable illumination that can still be used as a, uh, as a target for calibration, and it's used uh, for a number of sensors. Or it could be a set of well-characterized and instrumented sites on the ground with stated uncertainty for the measurements that are happening on the ground. And one such example is the RADCAL net, which is shown here. The RADCAL net is a, is a network of sites that have similar instrumentation measuring the reflectance at regular intervals, and which can be matched to the satellite measurements. And these are made openly available to satellite operators. So the RADCAL net is, is something that the uh, Committee on Earth Observation Satellites operate on behalf of all the member agencies. So that's, that's another way to um, calibrate um, satellites um, from in space using ground-based assets. So at this point, I'd like to introduce what is called an SI traceable satellite, or SITSAT, as we call it. Uh, SITSATs are going to be launched in the future. We don't have them yet. Um, but a SITSAT will, able to, will be able to achieve SI traceability while in orbit due to its ability to self-calibrate at unprecedented levels of accuracy. It's, pretty, it's as close as having equipment in the lab in space. So uh, these, we'll just look at some of the examples. So Claria Pathfinder from NASA and the TRUTHS mission from the European Space Agency are going to be, are the SITSATs that are going to come online uh, not too, in, the, not too, uh, in the not too distant, distant feature, future. And unfortunately, they are expensive to build and operate because they are primarily meant to uh, you know, monitor with very high accuracy climate variables. So you know how important it is to, to get us to know what's happening in the climate. So these are missions that are focused on climate monitoring, uh, high accuracy climate monitoring. And we talked about uncertainties. These missions can offer uncertainties that are well below 1%. So that's the kind of um, accuracy that these missions are able to provide because they are literally measurement labs in space, metrology labs in space. Um, but they can also be used as reference benchmarks, just like Landsat and Sentinel-2, which are well characterized. But unfortunately, we don't have them yet. So as a lead into the concept of the satellite cross-calibration radiometer, which I mentioned before, I would like to introduce what we call simultaneous nadir observations. It's simply coincident or near coincident overpasses over a given area of two satellites. So two satellites going in orbit, acquiring data over the same area at the same time. So we call them SNOs. So what I show here is an opportunistic SNO involving the Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 satellites, which we also call the uh, Landsat 8-9 underfly maneuver. So this happened when Landsat 9 was being raised to its uh, orbit soon after launch. And there was an opportunity for Landsat 9 to fly under Landsat 8. And that opportunity uh, was used to do some calibration, cross-calibration between the two satellites. And what you see in the graphic on the left-hand side, the, uh, the, the one on the one below with the map, is the ground trace of the two satellite paths uh, during the time they're underflying each other. So Landsat 9 underflying Landsat 8. 
So some teams from GA and there were other teams who were collaborating internationally who went out on the field and collected data, including drones, at the same time as the satellite overpasses to compare and cross calibrate the, uh, the measurements, both from the satellites, but also from the ground measurements at the same time. And what you see in the middle there is the perfect match of the, uh, the reflectance values from both the Landsats, but also uh, the data matches from the from the ground um, uh, validation work that the team's done. So this again goes to show you why the Landsats uh, are called the gold standard. So before I, we look at the concept of the satellite cross calibration radiometer or SCR as we start to call it from here on, and how it could be applied to cross calibration of other satellites in orbit, I'd like to acknowledge the very substantial contribution of several colleagues both here at GA the USGS, uh, KBR, i r and CSIRO to this open access paper that we published in April this year. So this is a substantial body of work focused on improving data quality and consistency to enable interoperability of multi-source data streams and was done in collaboration with US colleagues for several years. So it's not, it's not just um, you know, in the last couple of years. So we've been doing this over a number of years. So, um, for those of you who are interested in reading this paper in its fullness, I invite you to read the details which might not be covered in this presentation. I've provided a link uh, there for you to access the paper. So um, I'm just representing the, the work done by a lot of colleagues here. Um, so what is SCR? So it is a satellite, but it's not there. It's, it's just a concept. It's, it's not real. It's, it's a concept. So what I'm describing here is a concept that could be used for harmonizing data sets from multiple data, uh, multiple streams. So it is essentially a low cost hyperspectral satellite system that would have capability to emulate uh, of, you know, a, a reference or a benchmark satellite sensor and transfer that calibration or the, the transfer those characteristics from the reference sensor to a client satellite. And in doing so, uh, get the client sensor measurements from space to match those of the reference. So that's, that's what uh, the SCR is meant to do. And the objectives of the SCR would be to improve the quality and consistency of the data from the several systems that it will be um, transferring the calibration from and to, and enabling the multi-source data sets to be integrated for better insights, uh, increase the possibilities for accessing a greater range of uh, science quality data. And all of this, no doubt, will enable um, getting high returns uh, of, on the substantial investments made in Earth observation globally. So a change of pace here, shifting of gears, just to uh, go through the concept of operation of the SCR. So what we've got here is a, is a target area on the ground which is being illuminated by the sun. Uh, this could be anywhere on Earth. I've just shown Australia for context here. So we have the SER and a reference satellite. A reference satellite could be a satellite that we consider to have well-characterized sensor that we can uh, consider to be the reference or the, the standard which has been um, monitored over a long time. So in this case, it could be Landsat 8, 9, uh, one of the Landsats, or Sentinel-2 for that, uh, for instance. So the two satellites, I mentioned SNOs, the simultaneous native observations. So near coincident overpasses. So they're acquiring uh, data over the same area at the same time. Uh, when, when I say near coincident, I mean within a 20 minute window of each other. So that's the kind of the maximum permissible. Otherwise you, you start to see differences uh, because of the influence of uh, environment, clouds, weather, so many other things, and the illumination from the sun as well. So, um, so the SNO concept is used here uh, to acquire data from, um, from both the SCR and the reference. If you remember, I said the SCR instrument is a hyperspectral instrument. So what it is capable of doing is to record measurements over the entire visible near infrared spectrum using hundreds of narrow bands, which pretty much are packed together to give you almost a complete picture across the, the spectrum compared to a multispectral system, which has got broader bands that are placed, uh, that discrete bands that, are, that have gaps in between the, 
in between them, which means they don't cover the entire spectrum fully. So the hyperspectral system, the image from the hyperspectral system can then be used to create what we call a synthetic image that roughly corresponds to the multispectral image. There's a lot of cool physics and maths involved in it. I won't go into that, but the, the essential principle is using the full hyperspectral system to build your synthetic image that corresponds to the multispectral image here. Both required at the same time. So the next step in the process is using the synthetic image from the previous step, you compare it with the reference satellite's multispectral image. So, like I said before, you expect to see some differences because there are two different sensors. And you would then be able to um, generate what is called a difference image from, um, from this exercise and use the difference image to correct the SCR image. So basically apply the corrections because the reference is closer to the truth. We know that it's, it's monitored. We know that it's got traceable uh, reference. Uh, it's traceable to a known standard. Therefore, the, the difference image we, used, uh, we got here is used to correct the SCR image and essentially end up with an image that's equivalent to the, uh, to the reference. So, so what we, just to summarize the process, so we've got the SNOs going from the two satellites and you've got the hyperspectral image from SCR. Using that, you generate the synthetic image, compare it to the reference, generate a difference image, do the corrections and get a calibrated SCR image. Now, what we've, had, what we've done is the SCR is emulating the reference satellite now. Uh, because we've transferred the imaging characteristics back to SER. And therefore, the SER image captures will be equivalent to the reference. So to use an analogy is to think of how you might tune a, a guitar to a, an electronic tuner. So, so this same process, except in, the, in place of the guitar, you have the SER instrument, which you are emulating to the reference. So we've got the SCR now emulating the reference. Now the next step is to transfer the calibration from the SCR to a client satellite. So using the SCR, we're going to do the transfer across to the, to the client satellite. So exactly the same process. We use SNOs between the SCR and the client satellite. This could be any satellite that uh, is the target for improvement. So it could be any commercial satellite. Uh, same steps. So use the SCR image to build a synthetic image, compare the synthetic image to the client image, work out the difference, and apply the corrections to the client image because you're bringing the calibration from the reference across to SCR and back to the client. So this is, this is the process that then allows us to essentially transfer the process, uh, transfer the calibration from the reference to the SCR and to the client and therefore you have equivalent images now of this, the client behaving similar to what the reference does. So, all that is well and good. The question comes up, how do you know that that process of transferring the calibration from the reference to the client is done well? Well, the team um, that published the paper and did this work have done some simulations to look at the uncertainty of the transfer process. In terms of transferring the calibration across, what is the uncertainty? And this graph kind of gives you, the, uh, gives you an idea of the transfer calibration uncertainty, as we call it. It's a measure of how well the calibration is being transferred from the different systems. And what you see here is the green line, which is the total of the systematic and the random components of uncertainty. And what you see there is the percentage of uncertainty drops from about 5% to below 1% after 50 cross calibration opportunities. So when you have these cross calibrations between the SCR and a target system, after about 50 cross calibrations, the uncertainty falls to well below 1%. So this is the premise on which 
we know that you know this this will work if we had such a system up there. Fifty cross calibrations might sound like many, too many, um, but the orbit simulations here, again done by the team, shows you that the number of cross calibration opportunities possible between SCR and in this example Landsat 9 for one cycle of the SCR, one revisit cycle of the SCR and one revisit cycle of Landsat 9 is about 659 opportunities for cross calibration as you see in the table on the left hand side. So there are a lot of opportunities for cross calibration between the systems provided the SCR is placed in the correct orbit, uh, so the orbital altitude and the crossing times, uh, which, which I'll come to in the next slide, are factors that influence how many cross calibration opportunities you get between satellites. So in this example, the red traces are the ground traces of the uh, simultaneous nadir observations I mentioned between the two satellites for one cycle, and that is 15 million square kilometers, that's 10% of the total land area of Earth. So it's, it's quite a few opportunities in terms of how much you can get from space-based um, um, observations like this. This is not possible with ground-based uh, methods because the ground-based extents of targets on the ground are limited and if you throw on top of it um, weather phenomena, clouds, the opportunities are going to be pretty, pretty slim in terms of getting uh, regular observations. So, so this is uh, that was an example just for the SCR and the Landsat nine. But how do we know that these all these other commercial satellites out there are going to benefit from the crossings, um, you know, from the simultaneous near view observations that I mentioned? So again, the team did some uh, work to look at the choice of the orbital altitude for SCR and what we call the local time descending node, which is the, the time of crossing of a satellite over a, over a location. And for Earth observing satellites, it's usually the same time every day to keep the illumination constant over the year. So, um, so we looked at the combination of the al orbital altitude and the crossing time, in this case, 645 kilometers and 1020 AM as the local time descending node. And you can see that the opportunities for cross-calibration are maximized so that you get the sweet spot for those two, uh, for the combination of the 1020 AM and the 645 kilometer orbit. And the big uh, red bar shows you the number of Earth observing satellites that you can access through those SNOs with the SER by choosing that time. That time also means that we can access the uh, reference and benchmark satellites like uh, Landsat and Sentinel-2. So if you have all of that done, so this, this cartoon is really a metaphor for the kind of result you could expect if all of those satellites were calibrated. And to use the musical analogy, uh, all singing from the same song sheet, uh, symphony in, in, in space, harmonized symphony in space. So before I conclude the talk, I would like to share a couple of um, examples, as I mentioned before, to, to show you or to highlight some of the benefits you get from harmonized data, you know, how you could uh, get some better insights if you had harmonized data. In this particular example, um, if you recall the, the NDVI profiles from the, first, uh, from the initial slides I showed you, this is a similar profile for two categories of vegetation. The red profile being for irrigated alfalfa crop and the blue profile for natural grassland. And you see those categories in the, in the images uh, on the top, the images on the top. Uh, the green circles represent the alfalfa crop, the, the irrigated crop. Uh, you can see the um, uh, pivotal irrigation system showing up on the image. They're from different dates. And what you see here on the, on the graph is the pluses which represent the Landsat 8 satellite data and the diamonds which uh, represent the Sentinel-2. And you can see these data points are tracing a very smooth profile of NDVI values for the two categories of vegetation that are being monitored. If they were not harmonized, you wouldn't see the smooth pattern. You would, you would end up having those uh, noisy profiles which don't match. So this 
also gives us better insights. And by that, what I mean is you see, you see the sharp dips in the, in the red profile of the alfalfa crop. That corresponds to the mowing events that are happening. You wouldn't be able to pick these up if you didn't have the density of uh, data coming from both uh, the Landsat and the Sentinel-2 uh, systems. You, you, you miss those uh, very transient events. So this is just an example of what you can do in agriculture, but there are so many other phenomena, uh, you know, environmental phenomena that require a dense time series to capture uh, such, such uh, transient events. So that's, that's a good example of um, getting better insights by bringing together data from two different sources, but in a harmonized uh, manner. And this example, that previous example was from the US, uh, and I thank my NASA colleagues for sharing that with me. Uh, the, this one is uh, from Australia. Uh, this was done by our aquatic remote sensing team. And uh, this is a study on the tidal dynamics in coastal northern Australia. Again, the combined use of well-calibrated data from Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 complement each other to provide a better picture of the entire tidal range. The blue dots here represent uh, Landsat and the orange dots represent Sentinel-2 observations. Now the size of the dots um, also represent the quality. So the larger the dot, the better the quality. The smaller the dots, they are affected by cloud, by glint, and so on. So you'll notice in this graph that there's, there's no dearth of data in the higher tidal dynamic range, the higher end of the tidal dynamic range. There's plenty of data, both from Landsat and Sentinels. But as you come down to the lower end of the tidal dynamic range, you see that the observations from Sentinel are not of that high quality. So you, you see the smaller dots, the orange dots towards the, the lower end. But they are really made up, and the, that shortfall is being made up by the good quality Landsat, uh, which then gives you a fuller picture of the tidal dynamic range in a much shorter period. And you couldn't do that if you didn't have the full suite of uh, data coming from both Sentinel and Landsat. It's another example. So um, again, thanks to Robbie Bishop Taylor for, for that um, for that for the data. So I think I conclude my talk here with the key takeaway messages. Uh, we've seen that there's a trend uh, of you know, growing volumes of data coming mostly from commercial satellites, and that trend is expected to continue. Uh, we saw the huge potential in our region for creation of value from Earth observation data, and what we need to remember is the value creation only comes from use of data, from, uh, from applying that data to, uh, to generate economic activity. So um, that's where the, the need for quality comes in, um, and, and we've seen that quality and trust are really the underpinnings of uh, a thriving uh, industry sector, if you can use all these data sets to generate economic activity. Um, we looked at uh, the quality issues in Earth observation data and how interoperability could be uh, challenged uh, because of uh, quality issues. And I mentioned the collaborative work on cross-calibration approaches, both the ground-based methods and the space-based methods, and they complement each other. So even for the, um, the space-based systems, they use ground-based systems as a, as a means of independent verification. So they you need to have both um, to, to make sure that you can get the best out of the um, systems or the approaches. Uh, and then uh, finally, I showed you examples of the benefit realization from synergistic use of multi-source data streams. That, that was only two data streams, but imagine what possibilities could be if you had all these other commercial data sets uh, that you can use um, alongside each other. So I'll finish there and thank you very much for